Hey there, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. We are so honored that you would join us today. We hope you enjoy this message and we pray that it helps you see Jesus clearly through it. Good morning, Anchor Church. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we are going to continue our series right now uh, that we've called Suit Up, and it's a series on the armor of God. You want to take a few seconds now and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we'll spend most of our time this morning. Uh, this study that we're doing is called Suit Up, um, and it's a call to suit up to be ready for the battle. And I, I wonder if maybe you're asking the question or you have asked the question, are we in a battle? And, and the answer is yes. One of the main points, I think, that Kyle has said over and over through the weeks, and, and Tucker said it a couple of weeks ago, has, has been that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are a citizen. You're a citizen of heaven. And every citizen of heaven is a soldier. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're a soldier and you are in a battle. And, and I would argue or do my best to convince you that one of the enemy's greatest tactics today would be to tell you, oh no, it's a time of peace. You're good. It, it's fine. Relax. And these words like battle and war, those are extreme. Those are hyperbolic. Those are, those are too big of words. But let me tell you, that is a lie from the enemy. That God says that we are in a battle. Let me, let me read Ephesians chapter 6, just the uh, verses 10 through 12 for now. And it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Just uh, for the sake of review this morning, let me say, God has an arch enemy. And, and under his power are countless demons and minions and Satan is seeking to overrun the world with evil and to exclude God from his own kingdom. His desire is to steal, steal kill, and destroy. And, and Paul is doing his best here in Ephesians, um, and, and we are doing our best here at Anchor Church to express to all of us that we do face opposition in the Christian life. And it's not politicians, and it's not people who don't agree with us, and it's not people who have hurt us, and it's not your kids, and it's not Hollywood, and it's not your boss, and it's not social media influencers or whatever. It is Satan and his demons. And, and I love the way, actually, that the message paraphrase puts verses 10 through 12. It says this, and that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. Here, here's a really cool part. It says this. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. It is life or death, a fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. I know this isn't like sounding like great news right away, but if you are a follower of Jesus, you are in a war and Satan is in direct opposition to you. It's a hard word and I think um, potentially you might be thinking I should turn this message off, bring Kyle back, bring somebody else back, this is the wrong guy. But just, just wait a minute because there is actually really good news hidden in here, but it may feel like right away, ugh, I don't like this. And, and I know we've been saying it for weeks, but I, I really think it's important to remind us that before we move into the next piece of honor, or sorry, armor, it's very important for us to remember that we are in a war. We're in a war. The context of our spiritual growth as believers is a war zone. Um, think, think about that for a second. The context of discipleship or your growth is not a nice coffee shop or your living room where you are this morning 
or next to a fireplace, and though those things might help you to concentrate or get ready to read your Bible or whatever, and physically that may be where you're at, but spiritually the context of your growth in Jesus is a war zone. And here is why that's true. Satan does not want you to grow in your knowledge and your love and your stature and your holiness with the Lord. He is not okay with your relationship with the king of the universe, and he will do everything in his power to tip you over. That sounds like a war. Here's the second thing. So we're in a war, and the second thing is we are in a war in which we need the Lord's strength to win. And, and to me, this is where the good news starts to really uh, creep up for us. This is really important. This is not a war that you and I have the native capacities and capabilities and equipment to win. Our strength is inadequate. You may be saying, okay, well, where's this this good news? And so Paul writes actually in verse 10, which we've read already, but it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So we are in a war, one. We do not have the strength to do it. But it calls us to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then three, the third thing is, we have to put on God's armor in order to stand against the devil's schemes. He, he is after you. We are in a war. We have to put on God, God's armor. Now notice the language, put God's armor on. We are to put on the full armor of God. It, it isn't prepare yourself for battle with these pieces of armor that you can find. If you go on a quest that, to the ends of the universe, This is not armor you get to go buy at the store. This is not armor that you find at Bible college or in Awana or whatever else that you think where this God's armor is. This is God's armor. It it already exists. He has already created it. It is infinitely better than any armor you could prepare for yourself or create for yourself. In, In fact, God has worn it himself. Look at Isaiah 59, 17. I know we've looked at this in the past weeks too, but Isaiah 59, 17, where it says this about God. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Why does this matter? Why does this matter so much in review? Why are we going backwards at all in this? Why does this matter? It's because you need to know that this is God's armor that he has worn. It it isn't your well-made armor that you've built up. I, I would be overwhelmingly terrified if the verse said, finally, take up the armor that you should have been collecting and building up since you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because sometimes I just don't have it. I never have it. That, that would scare me because my self-made armor is not good. My, my skills and abilities and efforts are an absolute veneer. It's God's armor that we are asked to put on. Already worn by Him, already created by Him, His to give, perfectly made to extinguish the fiery arrows of the devil, all-powerful, perfect, without weakness. Notice the reason that we put on the armor of God, too, for this war. I'm going to throw these verses on the screen here and highlight what you, what I want you to see. And that, that way, when I ask you the question, what, what are these verses saying, you can just cheat and say, oh, I know the answer because I will have it highlighted. But verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Go to verse 13. Verse 13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all this to stand firm. And then verse 14 says, Stand therefore. That's how it starts. I won't read the rest of it right now. But do you see any repeated words in there? Do you you think that Paul is emphasizing what God wants us to do? Um... Therefore, put on the armor so you can advance. Is that, is that what it says? I don't see that. He's calling us to stand. Stand firm. Do you think that the Apostle Paul is concerned about you standing firm? Yes. Why? Why is this in here? Because our task as believers is one of holding firm or standing firm. It is not a matter of advancing. 
And here's why. God isn't that boss that wants you to come in on the weekends and finish the project so that he can get a raise or do better. God isn't uh, a tyrant who wants more ground. I want you to listen really carefully to this. In the person of Jesus Christ, God has already conquered death and Satan. He has given us the victory to hold. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, he has given you the victory to hold. Because of Christ, the enemy is already defeated and the church has been put here to stand firm in what Christ has already done. Satan is the one who must do the counterattacking in, in his efforts to dislodge us from victory. Satan is the one who is fin uh, frantically shooting arrows. Satan is the one who is trying to win ground. It, it's really interesting to me as I studied this that really the armor of God is defensive. It's not offensive. We aren't told to shoot arrows back. Even a sword can be defensive. Um, and if you don't believe me, just watch Star Wars. Uh, those lightsabers, they can deflect, deflect anything. It feels um, like cheating. But for our part, what God is calling us to do is we don't have to struggle to occupy space that is already ours. Romans 8.37 says it this way, that we are more than conquerors in Christ. In Him we stand. We stand firm. So today, we don't fight for victory. Um, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you fight from victory. You don't fight for it. You fight from it. You don't enter into a battle to win. We enter into the battle because in Christ we've already won. That doesn't mean that there aren't battles, but it's been won by Jesus. Overcomers rest in the victory that has already been given to them by God. And, and again, it doesn't mean that you aren't attacked or that you're not at war. But our position in everything when we enter into battle is this. If you're a child of the king, you are called to put on his armor and stand firm, knowing that he is doing the work, he is with you, and you can be confident in that. So, just again, one more time, um, sorry if I keep saying this, but one, you are in a war. Two, you can't do this on your own. You need the Lord's strength and his armor, and he provides it. And then three, when you put this armor on, the victory is yours. Your job is to stand firm against the evil one. So let's, with that, move into today's piece of armor, which is the helmet of salvation. Um, let's read verses 14 through 18 together of Ephesians 6, and they say this. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So just before going into battle, uh, the Roman soldier would put on his helmet. And this is an interesting piece of armor because I don't feel like a helmet needs a lot of explanation as far as what it did for the Roman soldier. Um, the soldier would wear this helmet that was either made of bronze or of leather with pieces of metal covering it. And, and it also had these, um, you've probably seen them on Roman soldiers, but these cheek pieces to protect part of the face. Um, and I don't mean to be so obvious to you, but I'm just going to explain the purpose of a helmet really quickly. The Roman soldier's helmet, um, and, and really any helmet, is designed to protect the head. In ancient times, many armies employed cavalry, so the soldiers were mounted on horseback and most carried what was called a broadsword, which would have been like three or four feet long, and two edges, a double-edged sword. Um, and it was swung by mounted soldiers on horses in an effort to either split the skull um, or decapitate the enemy. Um, and the helmet was essential in deflecting the blow of the sword. Again, it's really quite obvious uh, why the Roman soldier needed such a strong instrument on his head. Um, in the physical sense, it makes a lot of sense. E even for me, um, I actually this, this afternoon rode my... Um, motorcycle over here to record the sermon and I put a helmet on. Um, why? Because um, my mom has asked me to. 
No, I'm just kidding. Um, because <clears throat> so many of the important functions in my life are dictated by my head or my brain. Uh, the deadliest wounds that a physical enemy can inflict or a sidewalk can inflict or a street can inflict on you are where? Your head. Uh, your head is what commands your entire body. And this may be a little gruesome, hopefully not too much, but you can cut off an arm if you're a soldier or even me, uh, and I can still fight or still function. Be harder, sure. I can break a leg and I will heal. But if you cut off a head, the game over. It's finished, right? Nothing much that can be done after that. So physically, the need of a helmet is very obvious. Helmets really don't need much explanation, do they? Uh, whether you're a soldier, a motorcycle rider, a bicyclist, a football player, a construction worker, or a toddler learning how to walk, uh, you are well aware of the purpose of a helmet. It protects your head and everything in it. But what it is the sense of the spiritual truth that Paul is wanting to convey to us today? I think there are a lot of lines we can draw here, but I'm going to say it this way. I think the text says that the spiritual helmet that we are to wear, it's obvious, this is what the text says, is our spiritual battle, in our, into our spiritual battles is the helmet of salvation. Meaning, if you are saved, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are clothed on your head with His salvation. This isn't just a mental thing, like, I know. This is a physical, I am saved, I am covered. It is God's promise and his armor that covers your head. Also, you can walk with the assurance and the hope of Christ's triumph. But needing to have this helmet on your head indicates something to me, and that is that Satan's blows are aimed at our minds. He's coming after your head, your mind. He is intent on destroying our sense of security and our assurance in Jesus Christ. He wants you to struggle here in your head with the truth that if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you are saved, he wants you to struggle with that. If the devil can strike a blow against us that causes us to become discouraged and filled with doubt about our security in Christ, then he will have a little trouble sidelining us and taking us out of this battle where we are called to stand firm. Well, how does he do this? I think he has a broadsword with two edges. And I think the way he does it is through discouragement and through doubt. That's his broadsword, two different sides. If, if you and I are not properly protected, the devil will use the sword of discouragement and doubt to defeat us in our walk with the Lord. He will cause us to look at our sins and our failures and our problems in our lives and our health issues and the coronavirus or any other negative situation that we face in life. And when he gets our attention off the Lord and on the negative issues that we face in life, he knows we will begin to doubt God's love for us. Believer, if you're a follower of Christ, let me say this to you. Satan may disrupt your daily victory. He might. He probably will. But he can do nothing to disrupt your position and your identity in the Lord Jesus. Remember that. No matter what he says, no matter what he does, he cannot change the fact that Christ died for you and that you died with him when you gave your life to Jesus. And he cannot change the fact that Christ has risen and that you have risen with him when you gave your life to Christ. He is able to save you, but if the enemy can get you to believe for one moment that you're not strong enough in Christ or that you're not doing enough in Christ or you're not whatever enough, if he can get you to believe that for one moment that, that you're not on victory ground, he has you sidelined. The helmet of salvation is God's salvation. You can't earn it. You cannot fashion it. And verse 17 says it so clearly. It says, all you are responsible for doing is to take it. You are just called to take it and put it on. God is your salvation. 
Let that sink in. Put that on. Yeah, you may mess up. And, and the enemy will use that to make you think that you are not able to stand firm because guess what? You can't stand firm. You don't have that skill. But if you remember the truth that you are wearing the armor of God, that should change things. That is what causes you to have the ability to stand firm. No, you're right. You are not strong enough by yourself. Sure, the enemy can defeat you. He can. But the enemy cannot defeat God. And the enemy cannot defeat God's armor. And so the enemy cannot defeat you in God's armor because he cannot defeat God. What Paul is saying here in Ephesians is that the helmet of salvation is to be assured of your security, your past, your present, and your future security. Nothing can pluck you out of God's hand. And he's saying, if you know that, just what is it that Satan can take away from you? What can he take away from you? If you know, if you wear that on your head that nothing can take me from God, what can Satan take from you? I think that Satan would love for you to believe that the helmet of salvation was something that you put on in 1986 when you gave your life to Christ. That's, that's when I did. Or that the helmet of salvation was something that you put on in high school when you put your faith in Jesus. And, and that's true. Uh, if you have put your faith in Jesus, there is a moment in time when you started to wear the helmet of salvation, you knew Jesus. You were saved by his grace. The helmet is salvation. The helmet is the knowledge and the assurance of your salvation. But there is one other thing that the helmet of salvation does for us as believers. The helmet of salvation is the sure hope of the future as well. It's definitely salvation for what God has done for you in your past or what he's taking you out of. But it is the sure hope of the future as well. I think the enemy can sideline people like us, if you're a follower of Christ, who believe their salvation was a moment 10 years ago. Yeah, I put on the helmet of salvation 10 years ago. That's, that's when it happened. I think the enemy would love for you to believe that that's all there is to it. But what about now and to the end? Satan would love for you to believe that, that you're, you're not going to get to the end. That things aren't as good as they should be. You're never going to be able to see this Christian thing all the way through. You're fa falling at every hurdle. Or, or look where you are and look where everybody else is. And look at how you've been doing for a long time. And you can't even make it through the first level yet. How are you going to even get to the prize? But if you could just, by faith, take the helmet, you would realize that there's hope not only for what Christ has done for you, but what Christ is coming to do. A biblical sense of hope doesn't mean, oh man, I hope that will happen. It is a sure faith upon the word of God that it will happen. Look at um, 1 Thessalonians verse, uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 8. It says this, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Well, what is the hope of salvation? If you're a Christian and you've been saved, what is the hope of salvation? It is you or me saying, I don't, or, or actually, let me ask this question. Is it you or me saying, well, I don't deserve to be here. If, if you knew what I did yesterday, or if you knew the things I'm going through, or if you knew the temptations that I'm fighting against. Uh, guys, there is hope in the coming of our Lord. There is hope in the salvation that is coming and in the salvation that we already have access to. Here's, here's what's true for me. I will become greatly distressed and discouraged when I see the world around me collapsing and the culture collapsing. And I will begin to see my battle as a battle against flesh and blood. Unless the blessed hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is constantly on my mind. I encourage you and me to live looking for and believing in hope. The blessed hope of Jesus appearing and calling us a home. The blessed hope of Jesus coming again. That, that's the hope of the helmet of, the, of salvation. Yes, the helmet of salvation is salvation. You are saved. But it is also the hope for what is coming. 
What can the enemy do to attack a person who has hope in the triumphal return of Jesus Christ? What can the enemy do to a person who is confident that their salvation and security rests squarely in the shed blood and resurrection of Jesus Christ? What can he do? You place that on your head and he, he cannot make a fatal blow to you. He can't. I love uh, Philippians, the book of Philippians, but chapter 1, verse 6, which is such a, a coffee cup verse. I'm sure many of you have heard it, but it says this, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That is hope. Yeah, the good work has started. Yeah, he has saved you. Yes, he's not opposed to you even making an effort to be holy, but he is bringing you to completion. He has started the work and he will finish the work. You can be sure of this too. Again, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will carry you to completion. When you have the helmet of salvation on your head, you can see that Jesus will bring about the good work to completion. That's hope for the future as well. He will. He is doing it right now, and he will continue to do it. The, po the point behind a good helmet is that it is an absolute confidence builder. Obviously, the main point is that it saves your head, but it's also an absolute confidence builder. I love riding my motorcycle, but if I'm not wearing my helmet, man, the whole time, just wondering, what if I hit a rock? What if I slide on some gravel? Driving extra slow, being extra careful, probably actually making it more dangerous for myself. But I'm just terrified. Because one small mistake, and that could be it for me. A good helmet builds hope and confidence. And let me ask you this. How is your confidence in the Lord Jesus? You need the helmet. You need the helmet. I need the helmet. Can I uh, just take a minute here to speak to those of you who may be watching, um, who maybe don't have the helmet of salvation because you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. Let me say, Satan is going for your thoughts and your mind and your intellect and your reasoning too. He's attacking you too. He wants you to think incorrectly, to doubt and to be in despair. And the Bible actually says that the God of this age, which is Satan, is blinding the minds of the unbelievers. He, he wants to attack you. Jesus wants hope for you. Jesus wants peace for you. And Jesus gives those things to you. And the helmet of salvation is for you as much as it is for me. And maybe, just maybe, God is reaching out to you right now and you feel desire to put your faith in Jesus. I want the helmet of salvation. Maybe you're saying that. Because you want the hope of salvation, both now and in the future. Well, you can have it. You can have it. I love verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 6, where it starts up talking about the helmet of salvation and the word that it uses is it says, and take the helmet of salvation. We, we could maybe more accurately say the Greek word for take means to receive. Receive the helmet of salvation. Because salvation is not won by efforts of our own, but if we ever possess it, our possession is the result of our accepting it as a gift from God. The very first word that God would speak to you is not do this or don't do that, but take this. Take this from the hands that were nailed to the cross. Take it. Take the helmet of salvation, the beginning of all true life, of all peace, of all self-control, of all hope, lies in the humble and repentant acceptance of the free gift of salvation, which Christ gives, and which he has nothing, or which, sorry, which you have nothing to do but take. Take it. Receive it. And, and I'd like to speak, too, for a minute to those of you that know Jesus and you're a follower of Christ and you're a believer in Christ. And you've received the helmet of salvation. You've taken it. Your battle today is a war against your mind. It's a war against your mind. It's a war against Satan who's attacking your mind. 
What are you renewing your mind with today? What are you renewing your thoughts with today? The helmet of salvation offers you protection of your thoughts. Are you putting that helmet on? Are you renewing your mind with the reality of who God is and what he's called you to? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. They say this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let me say this to you, if you're a follower of Christ, if you are struggling to stand firm, putting on the helmet of salvation, if you are feeling discouraged or displaced, or even if you are in a good place, Peter addresses and he brings home the truth right away about what we have in Christ. We have a living hope based on the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We have a living hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Living hope. I, I, I remember um, being younger and shooting hoops in my parents' driveway. And it, and it always turned, and maybe you can relate to this or throwing a baseball or whatever. It always turned into me shooting a last second three-pointer by myself in my imagination uh, shot that I made uh, in the NBA to win some sort of title, probably with the Bulls. Michael passed me the ball and I drained a three. Um, sometimes I would think I was in the NBA. Sometimes I would just pretend I was playing on the, my hometown's high school varsity basketball team and we won the state championship. But all of those were like little kid dreams in my driveway. And, and my hopes and dreams of being a famous basketball player faded. They faded big time. I know that might be shocking to some of you, but they faded. That's not going to happen. And I, I think that while I'm becoming more aware that the longer I go down the road of life, I check off more and more things that I thought would be one day. Oh, I will do this, or I will be that, or this will happen, or I'll have this much money, or whatever. I check those things off my list that I thought I would do one day, but I found that the longer I go down the road regarding my spiritual life, the opposite is true. The more I know Jesus, the more I realize that my hope doesn't lie here. It does not lie in Missoula necessarily. It does not lie uh, in this life, physical life necessarily. It does not lie with um, me being on a varsity basketball team or making $10 million. My hope is in heaven. And, and here is the thing. This is what 1 Peter tells us. My inheritance is imperishable. It is undefiled and unfading, and it is kept in heaven for me. And I, I think for some of us, myself included, sometimes we believe that we keep things going, that my inheritance better be guarded by me. I better purchase LifeLock for it or whatever those things are called. But I love this scripture because it says that my inheritance, my hope is kept by the power of God. It is not us holding on to him. It is him holding on to us. And I think some of us, maybe all of us, need to hear this today. The picture that comes to mind for me is with my kids. I will say frequently to my girls especially, hey, hold dad's hand when we go through this parking lot or across the street. Please hold my hand. And they do. But if they forget or they get tired and loosen their grip, guess what? It doesn't matter. Because although they thought they were holding my hand, in reality, I was holding theirs. And I would never let go. And I think some of you need to hear this. You may think you are fighting in God's army because he needs you. Or, or you may think you are fighting in God's ar army in order to stay in God's army. Or you may think you are working your way into reserving your spot in God's army or on the team. The helmet of salvation says to us very clearly, he is holding you. 
You're not holding his hand. He's holding yours. He is keeping you in his power. His salvation has been given to you. All you had to do was receive it. And I hope that gives you extreme hope this morning. I hope that that covers your head with so much clarity and hope this morning. As we sing one more song here, think about this quote that I read this week from Paul David Tripp. And it says this, You have not been left to secure your future, your own future. Because God is God in his grace has secured an end to your story more glorious than you can grasp. This is the assurance that you and I get when we take into battle the helmet of salvation. Well, we hope you enjoyed that message. We pray it blessed you. If you'd like any information on Anchor Church or to get connected, go ahead and visit us at www.goanchorchurch.com. We will see you next time and we hope you have a great rest of your day.